How's it going, YouTube? It is the first episode of the Phase 4 study vlog, and I decided to do a little bit of a different format for Phase 4. Um, so for this phase of Flat Iron School, I'm going to be having my dad on these episodes with me, and I'm going to be explaining to him in the best way that I can the things that I'm learning in each module. Uh, he is a psychologist and not a uh, computer person, so uh, this will be fun to try to, a good challenge for me to try to explain these things in a way that makes sense to him, right? Um, I feel like that's a good indication that I understand it pretty well if I'm able to explain it uh, in a way that makes sense to somebody that's uh, not in the know of like this sort of like, like machine learning and that sort of thing. So uh, if you're in the channel, if you're new to the series, uh, what's basically going on is I'm a student currently at the coding boot camp called Flatiron School in their data science program. I'm in phase four of five. We're getting into advanced machine learning concepts here. So uh, if you're curious about Flatiron School or how to enroll in it uh, or what, it, what other opportunities it has and all that, that'll be linked in the description below as well as the GitHub repository for all of the labs and things that I'll be using in this vlog series. Cool, so I don't know if you want to introduce yourself or your name. Uh, uh, I'm Robert. Mm -hmm. You look at, oh, this, the camera, not the computer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so they, they'll be able to see what's going on over here. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'm trying to get into this. Right, that's what you want to pay attention to, the TV monitor over there. Um, so normally I do like, I put like, I, I, for phase three, I was putting like a notebook together for these study vlog videos. That was a lot of work and like the payoff for all the work wasn't really worth it for me. So I'm just going to be scrolling through some of the like, um, material provided by Flatiron School, um, rather than through a Jupyter notebook like I've done in the past. So what this module was all about was, uh, something called principal component analysis, which is a type of unsupervised learning, as you see right there. So you remember um, when I was doing phase three, I was telling you that I was learning all this supervised learning mm -hmm. stuff, and that required like a label, right? So you would have like so many different columns, and that would be like what you were predicting all right. with, and then one column would be like the label if it's, you know, one or zero, or you could have like, you know, one, two, three, four, or five, or whatever kind of labels, but you needed like some feature that was like basically the answer sheet Right, and then that's what you would test to the model against is how closely it got the answer sheet right. right. So this is unsupervised learning, and that's basically a way of, um, unsupervised learning broadly is a mathematical approach to find um, kind of groups or patterns in the data without having a label, right? So you're looking, oh, okay. it's you know kind of like how like one feature correlates with the other like mathematically. So um, don't worry about all the text and everything. This visualization is what I wanted to show you. Um, that's like after this whole module, this very first visualization they showed is the best thing to me that represents like what's really going on with principal component analysis, which is the type of unsupervised learning that I learned in this module. So you can see it's kind of going through iterations. Um, and what's really going on is like you've seen regression analyses before where it has like the one regression line and it goes diagonal. Basically this is creating uh, multiple regression. They're not really regression lines, but they're lines plotted nonetheless. And you can see that it kind of iterates through different ones until it finds the ones that uh, separate these four different clusters the best. And the algorithm discovers like what the uh, slope and intercepts of these lines are just through kind of like a mathematical algorithm. But so that's what's going on basically is it's calculating uh, what the slope and intercept of each of these lines is and how many different lines there should be based on uh, the mathematical correlations between each one of these data points. Okay, and that's what this is representing? Right. Mm -hmm. You have any questions so uh, far? Well, uh, that, that, my question would be is uh, on some of your uh, dots, like mm -hmm. uh, there's some of them are very concentrated, some of them are more scattered. Right. Uh, and how 
this line over here uh, is representing which, which dots or which X's. You're talking about this line on the right right here? Yeah. Yeah. So this exactly. is your sum of squares is what this is representing and it's good when your sum of squares goes down generally right. speaking. Okay. So what your sum of squares is is like so ignore like this for a second and imagine just like a regular scatter plot with like a diagonal line, right? Okay. Um so if I drew a line from each point to that regression line and so I just had a bunch of lines like this. Um, they'd be like on the bottom too. I would take the distance of all those lines, those, that's called your residuals, and I would square them and sum them all up. And okay. that gives you a calculation of like what your overall that's what that graph. Is. Right. It's okay. showing it's the square of the sum of residuals, the sum square. And the fact that that's reducing that 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 value, the sum of squares is going down, uh, indicates that these lines are getting closer and closer to their best fit. Okay. Right. The further off the line is from the actual data points, because the line is a predicted data point. It's a vector that represents right. a right. set of predictions. So um, the further off that line is from its like respective data points, like the greater the residual is going to be therefore the grade of the sum of squares. So that's what that's showing is like as like obviously that's not a really great to like boundary line for like this cluster. So your sum of squares is pretty high, and as these boundary lines get closer and closer into these gaps here, meaning the sum of squares is less, like the okay. that reduces. So that's just like a performance metric, basically. Okay. So a lot of times it's hard to like you can't it's difficult to really like efficiently visualized to this that. degree over iterations with, with that. Yeah. so it's a lot easier just to pull like your sum of squares and look at that okay. instead of having to, it takes yeah. a lot of computing power to make plots so um a lot of times when you like are just iterating through and you know it's not like the model yet you know you're just trying to like improve it it's a lot easier to use just performance metrics like that than it is to actually like plot everything um so that gives you some idea like mathematically what's going on with principal component analysis. What the whole goal of it is, is, I don't want to go there yet, um, is to reduce the dimensionality of a data set, right? Mm -hmm. So the same way it's like computationally expensive to produce graphs like that, it's also becomes exponentially more computationally expensive the more features you have in a data set. Right. And it's exponential, right? It's not right. linear. Yeah. Um, so if you have like, you know, there's data sets out there that might have like a thousand different columns or something, right? Uh, and it might not be efficient to train a model on so much data. So what PCA does is it reduces the number of features in, in a data set without, or like, and by losing as little information as possible between all that data so you could like randomly drop like different like features from the data set and be like okay but you're probably going to lose some like predictive power when you do that if you're just randomly dropping features so what principal component analysis does is it's a way of compressing like a thousand rows into like a hundred rows or something and it does that with some fancy math that kind of compresses all that information or as much of it as possible into those hundred rows without instead of just you know randomly dropping like 900 of them yeah. or whatever so that's what um this notebook kind of illustrates so this is like a data set of just like some faces um and you can imagine like for one like pca could be used for like facial recognition if you're trying to like you know cluster like the eyes and the mouth and like different stuff like that you know um like it's pretty clear that there's like clusters of data like on a scatter plot here um, it's a little less intuitive when you think about it, it like, starts to make sense how that can be used to uh, cluster different okay. yeah. sections of an image. Because that's ultimately just data to the yeah. computer. Right. So PCA, there's kind of a workflow you go through. I'm not going to get into all the math and everything, um, but there's a checklist somewhere. 
Um, but so you can imagine there's a ton of data. These are pretty like high res images. So there's a ton of data in here and it would take a lot to, uh, to label all the data and it would, to do whatever you wanted to do like with that if you were doing kind of predictive modeling. So this is showing, uh, like I said, it's also a question of like how many, like this has four different principal components mm -hmm. and it's just trying to find like, you know, like the best fit lines. Uh, maybe you want five principal components, maybe you want six or three, you, you don't really know, right? Um, so this is showing you basically how much variance in the data is explained based on how many principal components you have. Which obviously you want to be able to explain more variance than not, right? right? So this tells you that you don't want 20 principal components, but uh, you know, if a hundred is like taking a really long time to run, then like you probably get away with 90 and 95 and get just about oh, okay. yeah. 0.9. So that's what that's like showing. So um, there's different steps in doing PCA. Um, and this is kind of showing like what one of these images looks like halfway through. Mm -hmm. So this is like if we took just the means of all the columns in the data set that represents this image. Uh, and you can see that's like pretty good. Like you can recognize that it, at least that, that it is a face, right? Right. Um, so this is the compressed data set raw, if you will, before we like reproject it. So this is what happens to the original image when it's been compressed down with PCA, but uh, using the right math, we can get, I think those are clearly different images, um, but you can imagine this being as fuzzy as that one was, oh, okay. uh, and you can, from the compressed data, you can get back, like, pretty close to what the original image was, so, like, if you scroll up and look at, there's one of these guys, is that image mm -hmm. down there with the glasses? So that's the original image. I think it's that one. Okay. And then you look at that. Mm -hmm. That one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of them. Um, is that guy at least? Yeah. Right. Um, so you can see like the resolution is some of it's lost, but it's still clearly like that guy. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that gives you kind of an idea of what happens when when you're when you're losing some features you're going to lose some information but pca is able to retain a lot more of the information uh than just like kind of vanilla compression would i see yeah okay. um so that is really useful for um there's probably better algorithms to use if you're trying to compress data for the sake of transferring data from one machine to the other but for the sake of machine learning if you're trying to evaluate a data set this just kind of shows that pca is pretty good at reducing your computational cost by but also retaining a lot of the information because we were able to reproject mm -hmm. this image from the compressed data uh, so that's basically what's going on with pca and so okay so here's you can see this is with 10 principal components with 20 principal components with 30 principal components my principal comp mm -hmm. components were saying features. So say if there was like right. originally a thousand features, when we have, we project it to 30 principal components, that's just saying we reduce it from a thousand to 30 features, which is obviously right. gonna be much easier to compute. Um, which has to do with the line that went up like this, and then over right. to the 30, mm -hmm. almost. This is what that line represents, yeah. basically. Yeah. 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 Um, so what? That's basically PCA in a nutshell. What, what kind of questions do you have, or? What uh, well, I, um, when when it comes to the principal components, basically, the way I'm seeing it is the resolution just becomes more clear. Mm -hmm. Uh. And but one, think of with one aspect, but the identifying capability 
at 30 principal components is as good as 110. Right. Yeah. So 110 would be kind of like overkill. Right. Yeah. I'll wait. All right. And we are back. Let me get you in the frame. There we go. Okay, so yeah, you picked up on intuitively that this is kind of showing that beyond like maybe 70, 80 principal components, uh, you're really not gaining much in performance. Right. At that point. Yeah. Um, which is part of like my job as a data scientist is to figure out what that number is, how many principal components. Yeah. You know, so you prototype, you'll build, you know, like a dozen different models with you know different varying amounts of principal components and you know, evaluate the performance metrics of each one and pick the one that um, is the the best and you know like depending on like the purpose uh this might be good enough you know and that's kind of where your domain knowledge comes into play um you know like for just purely for aesthetic reasons like this is the easiest one to look at for me you know, right. I guess this yeah. one, like technically, but like, but it doesn't get, get much once, better once after you get that. to there. Yeah, right. Yeah. But for your specific purposes, like you know, you know, forty or fifty, that might be enough for what you're doing. Um, you know, and that gets into like your specific problem that you're solving. Would, would that be uh, similar to like your facial recognition on your computer to to open it up? Mm -hmm. So and, and so you could probably get by with a much lesser yeah um number of components or something i don't specifically know like what software they're running for those things um i imagine you want it to be pretty good but it doesn't need to be like um it needs to be pretty good to the computer not necessarily pretty good to the human eye right yeah you know? yeah um, well i was just thinking the difference in a your personal phone deal mm -hmm. or some uh, secure facility at the CIA or somewhere right. where, where it would need facial, yeah that you would definitely yeah. well so, so what so what they do is they'll there'll be some research team with some data scientists and some data engineers and like different people like that and they will build a model which I can actually show you in this notebook I'm pretty sure. Um, so, uh, this variable right here, like that is, that contains the model, right? Um, so this is, this is a model being built right here. It's a support vector machine, which there's a ton of different types of models. There's decision trees and linear regression, blah, 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 blah. So support vector machine is just one type of model. What is going on here is remember I was saying you have to kind of prototype different models. Um, this is what this code represents is basically like. Can I start in selfies? I guess not. Um, so imagine like a list of numbers like one, two, three, four, five, all separated by a comma. Um, what this is saying is it's saying give me. 11 different values evenly spaced between point 0.1 and 10 and create a list of that so that's what's going on there right and so you can imagine like this all together makes a grid of you know 11 different values for c which i don't even fully understand what c is but it's something that you're supposed to like experiment with different values um, gamma is the same thing um and so what's going on here is it's looking at all the different possible, it's building a model um, for each different possible combination of these two things, of each value in this list. And then it's returning to you uh, the combination that gives the best performance on whatever your performance metric is that you chose. There's different metrics that you use for different things. Um, and so that's what it's telling me here. Is that these were of all the different combinations? These are the ones that produce the best performing model. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought, but um, but so that's like what, what 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 you're talking about facial recognition. So what they'll do is they'll do this kind of workflow, um, much more in depth, right? Because if these large companies, they have like months and months to develop this stuff. Um, but they'll eventually arrive at a model 
that um, is, you know, achieves their goals, whatever their needs are. And then they'll do what's called pickling that model, uh, which is basically uh, compressing the model itself so that it can be exported and sent to, it, to other machines. It mm. takes so right now, you, like on a computer, you have you have memory and you have storage, right? Storage is like the stuff like in your files and folders and like things that like anything in storage is something that when you turn the computer off, like completely shut it down and boot it back up again, it's still there. That's what's in storage. Okay. Memory is anything that when you shut the computer down and boot it back up, it's not there anymore. Oh. Right. So like these notebooks that you see me running, when I close the notebook, even not even shut down the computer and I reopen it, I have to rerun each one of these cells. All this information, all this stuff that's been built, like when I run the cell, oh. it just disappears. Okay. Um, so because it's just kind of being like held in the ether until I shut down the notebook and then it disappears. Um, which is why I um, end up staying up pretty late sometimes working on this stuff because I don't want to I don't want to shut the notebook down and wake and up in the morning through. and have to yeah. rerun it for like thirty minutes like just yeah. to get back to where I started. Right. Um, so uh, what they'll do once they get a model that's like you know that they're happy with, then they'll pickle it, uh, which is just a way of saying like they export it and so they'll package it into like a file. You know, the same way you can download a CSV file, you know, or like an Excel sheet or whatever, yeah. and package it in a way that you can yeah. it can be downloaded, and then that actual code that is like that model will be installed into like the the devices that, that they're using the the facial recognition model. Okay. So, but that so that's what they'll do is they'll build a machine learning model, and then once they have like um they finally get the model that's like you know like succeeds at their goals, then they'll export that into like an actual file and, and install it into the hardware and like whatever devices. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like getting like trained necessarily. It's not retraining a model every time it reads your face or whatever. It's like the same model running every time. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, but that, that's where it all starts is like something, something like this. Um, yeah, and then for computer's purposes, especially if it's like you know dealing with like like UV or infrared or something, um, then uh, you can maybe get away with even less resolution for your photos. Yeah, you know, um, which is another way of like kind of reducing your computational complexities, capturing the photo in a different format mm -hmm. that where it might be nonsense to a human, but it you know will be even more information to a computer, but with less features. So. And I'm sure that's another thing that they experiment with. They probably will have like photos taken with different types of, um, you know, like lighting or like you know UV or infrared or whatever, and they test like all these models with all these different types yeah. of their photos and all that. Like I said, these big tech companies, they have the time and the money to. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's just a yeah. Crazy stuff. Okay, let's say at the. Uh, oh, well, I'm not sharing the screen. It's okay. We're good. Okay. Let's say at the. 40 principal components uh -huh. uh, on uh, I'm, an, I'm imagining a facial recognition mm -hmm. thing okay uh, the, the glasses this guy has on so mm -hmm. everything's good mm -hmm. uh, if he changes glasses mm -hmm. then theoretically I'm just saying, hypothetically it may be at one of those components it wouldn't recognize him whereas this one down here that's got so many mm -hmm. comparisons mm -hmm. that it would still recognize that face even with different glasses. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, there's some amount of information that it needs to... A good enough model would recognize the frames as noise. And like, yeah. There's like yeah. noise and data. Yeah. Um, but that's why I'm a good enough model would recognize that. Yeah. Um, but for that model to be so good it needs uh, enough data to be trained on to be right. that good. in terms of those principal components right yeah mm -hmm. um, the facial recognition specifically i don't know that they like they definitely don't strictly use pca i mean there's other algorithms that will like oh. classify like landmarks on the face and measure like the distance from you know like the yeah, eyebrow to the cheekbone yeah, or yeah. like something like that okay um and like that 
Okay. Obviously, yeah. it would like get around the issue of like the glasses like, right. being there. If you were doing strictly PCA, you would uh, you would need so many principal components to get around this whole glasses thing that it would almost not be worth it to do PCA. Okay. Um, so PCA is usually it's m more often used for pre-processing. Like you can build a model with PCA alone, um, but it's mostly used for pre-processing the data. Meaning, so when I say pre-processing, it's all the stuff you do to the data before you start building the model. Okay. Um, but you just, you have to build some models to evaluate right. how the PCA is performing. Um, so the next thing I want to show you is what you've seen, like, kind of visually what's going on with PCA. Now I want to show you, like, more or less mathematically what's going on with it. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this as, like, low level as good as possible. <laughs> Okay, so this is our data set, and this is just the first five rows. There's, you know, uh, hundreds of, of rows here, but um, this is all you really need to know, right, um, is what your columns are and, um, like, what types of values are in each column, right? Fortunately, this is all, in computer science, we call floating points, which is a computer science word for decimals. Um, you have decimal uh, floating points. Uh, these are this is actually integers because this whole column is one, two, or three, or zero or one or two. Sorry, three three different possible yeah. values. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes, like the target, a lot of times for my like my last project, the target was binary. It's either zero or one, and that's oh. called boolean value. Um, so anyway, we have this data set. Um, what this is, it's different flowers, different types of flowers um, and this the zero the one or the two corresponds to a type of flower right and this is the information about the petal length petal width blah 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 you can conceive how you could you know uh, with enough data trained to train a model you could train it to identify the species of the flower just based on the morphology of the, the leaves and whatnot right mm -hmm. so that's kind of like the broad strokes what's going on here this is Showing this is called a scatter matrix. I wonder if I can zoom out so I can fit this whole thing. Yeah. Um. So the the diagonal you see here is the uh, feature corresponding with itself. So you see sequel link here and the sequel link here. So this is just the just the diagonal. All these are just like the distribution of like the respective feature. Right, so this is like the distribution of different sepal lengths. Right, the scatter plots you see here are the scatter plot of a given feature against some other feature. So this scatter plot represents the sepal length on the x-axis and the sepal width on the y-axis, and it shows how those two features like distribute with each other. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so this is like this data point is like the only one that happens to have that exact sequel length with that exact sequel width. Right. Right. Um, and so this is usually, you usually look at this sort of plot at some point or another just to see, like you can already see like some of these are showing us some clusters. Like this cluster is probably also this cluster, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, and like this plot I think is length, sequel length. Sequel length, sequel width. Okay, or or yeah, yeah. Petal length, sequel. Length. Yeah. So this is the exact same. Um, basically, everything on this side of the diagonal mm -hmm. is a reflection of everything on this side. You can kind of choose which one you want to look at. Um, but but you can see here, like we have pretty yeah. similar clusters. Um, so you can imagine like you could have a scatter plot. You could have a three dimensional scatter plot where the clusters would be like at varying depths of on on the z axis. Right, so like imagine I've got a scatter plot down here. Good. What was I saying about the scatter plot? Yeah. So imagine like right now it's like it has colors to represent like the different clusters. Uh huh. But you can imagine if they're all the same cluster, but it's a three-dimensional plot. Those clusters would be like a different depth. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Um, and so PCA is a way of taking like those three-dimensional clusters and compressing them into a two-dimensional plot, like this. Um, which this doesn't represent that because we have the have the colors to mm -hmm. um, distinguish them, um, and that doesn't mean anything to the computer. But you can imagine, like with some fancy math, you can 
adjust these points to different positions where they're kind of like averages, if you will, of like the point versus the other two like clusters. Um, and again, like we can't really get super in depth in the math there because it gets like pretty heady pretty quick. Yeah. But if you took this data set and compressed it in PCA, you could represent this same information represented by this scatter plot without the colors. The dots would be in different positions, but you could reconstruct this oh, okay. from that, right? Um, and instead of it, I mean, it, that's supposed to be three dimensions, right? Right. And so if you compress it, then what do you got? Two dimensional? Yeah, it would look different, but the same information could be oh, okay. gleaned from it. Okay. So, Remember, this is like our original data. So when you're doing PCA, the first thing you're gonna do um, is, this is scaling the data. So imagine like different features might be on different scales. So when I did like the real estate pricing project, um, like the square footage of a house and um, the, let me think, I'm thinking back to like three projects ago, um, the square footage of a house and like its zip code or like its coordinates or something are like obviously not on the same scale, right? So you use scalars to kind of force everything to the same scale. So it's like comparable. So this, these two columns represent what is represented by these four columns. Okay. So this data frame right here, which is a spreadsheet in essence, is basically the same, or it represents the same information that that original mm -hmm. data frame does, right? Um, so these numbers are completely different, and obviously to like a human, or like even to a computer, any one of these numbers is pretty meaningless. Yeah. Um, but this data frame right here could be uh, reprojected back to the original data okay. frame. And so that's kind of like your proof that it represents the same information because okay. so you can reverse, reverse engineer it. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. You can do, I thought there was one more visualization here. That I want to show. Uh, yeah, and that's just a different way of showing how it like draws the decision boundary. Um, if I was doing this like for work, I would probably keep working on this a little bit because you see these burrs here mm -hmm. that stick out and it's trying to capture these data points with this group. See all these blue right yeah, here right. belong in like the tan. Um, that's probably overfitting. You know, um, that's, that's a great example of what I mean by overfitting is that you yeah. can imagine if it just like zigzag or like this, if we had like just something like straight out here and just captured that, mm -hmm. that's probably an anomaly because of how close it is to all these other data points that are from the other group, right? right? Um, so if you just like over tune the model to capture that specific data point, you're probably fitting it to the specific data set and not the population of all of the uh, iris yeah. fibers in the world. Yeah, um, so that's what I mean by, anytime you hear me say overfitting, that's what I'm like kind of referring to. Um, yeah, so, in summary, principal component analysis is a way to identify clusters of data, or in other words, labels, without having those labels in the first place. Um, and you can create a pretty good model with it on its own, but more often than not, it's used to pre-process the data. So what I mean by that is instead of feeding the model this data, we can feed it only this and exponentially reduce the computational complexity required and if you're dealing with something that has you know like a hundred row 100 columns and like a million rows or whatever that really matters with well, this yeah. particular data set small enough anyway it wouldn't really be a necessity in like a professional setting but you can see like uh, yeah yeah understand what it's doing mm -hmm. yeah and there's like there's a kind of like a checklist you go down to get to this point you like um, calculate the mean of each feature and you subtract the mean from each value in that uh, feature and then 
where it really gets really mathy is you calculate what's called an eigenvector and an eigenvalue. Um, and you know, a vector is basically just like a list of numbers. Um, and so that eigenvector is what becomes like your new feature, basically. Okay. Um, and they didn't even begin to go into like the actual math behind calculating an eigenvector. They were just like, you know, here's the here's the code library that you use right. <laughs> to, which is probably for the best. Um, yeah. As long as you understand what it's doing, you don't necessarily right. need to be able to write the proof yeah. by hand, you know. Um, yeah. So that is principal component analysis, and that's what I learned in the first module of phase four. And and uh, let me see if I can summarize that what you were doing, you were taking data. Mm -hmm. And it was doing this analysis where it presented labels for what it was determining, or it, it determined things that you could label because you started without labels in order to identify certain things. Sort of. So, with the grid search thing that I was showing you, basically what that's doing is it's trying like six different regions and five different regions and four different regions until it's finding the one where the sum of squares is the least. So you can imagine these ones where, um, feel it restart in a second, where they're like basically slicing through these clusters. Your sum of squares is going to be like way high. Mm -hmm. Right, so what the analysis part of principal component analysis is doing is you're trying to find what the like ideal number of principal components to use is. And then once you know what that number is, then you build a model with those, with that specific number of principal. You, you, you basically manually, you tell it when you're building the model, given five principal components or six principal components or seven or a hundred or whatever, right? So the analysis part is analyzing like there's some squares or whatever other performance metric to figure out what number of principal components performs the best and then once you know that number then that's the like the data that you use the like compress to that specific amount of principal components okay. all right so you'll try it with like you know yeah so many different ones you'll find the one that performs the most right that, yeah uh, and you usually do that by you know this is showing with your sum of squares but you also use it with your explained variance which was that other curve that you saw. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Get all that loose. <laughs> so, any more questions? No. So, do you feel like if you heard about principal component analysis, like on the news or Reddit, and like I would uh, kind of have, have a grasp of what they were talking right. about? Right. Yeah. That was kind of my goal is that you, you know, have like a bird's eye view of like, yeah, you're yeah. at least aware of what they're talking about yeah, and like what it relates to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, I never really remember paying attention to very much analysis. Yeah, this is pretty obscure unless you're like specifically working with like you know, heavy statistics or machine learning or something, I don't think you would come across this by chance. Um, if you kept up with, like, the news around technology, then you might hear about it. But yeah. even then, you're going to, that still didn't kind of bring in specific. Yeah. yeah, if I saw PCA, it's something I had no idea. But now I would uh, maybe go, oh, I bet that's still. Right, yeah, yeah. Could be something else, I guess, in some other field. Probably, they might, they maybe, might yeah. Different, you know. But, um, uh, but I'm sure PCA yeah. is used in any field that uses statistics. So, like, if you're a researcher, well, yeah. like an academia, yeah, so like, depending on you would, uh, yeah, statistics, you would recognize. Right. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well. That is it for this 
study vlog. This has been module 33 of phase 4. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if, like I said earlier, if you want to explore the GitHub repository, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, or check out Flatiron School, all those links will be down below. And uh, with that, we'll see you in the next study vlog.